So for the next hour or so, I'm going to be walking you through, as it were, ideas around the term sustainability and what it means to creative practitioners and how its complex nature can probably will and maybe already has led to internal conflicts around how we develop our own sustainable credentials. Now, this talk isn't about why we need to change or make changes, although it is implied, it do kind of skirt on these issues. Um, and it's not about providing answers either. Um, it's about being aware as to what it is to be a sustainability, sustainability orientated creative practitioner and it can be difficult but it certainly isn't unachievable so now uh, i've got some kind of slideshow as well that i'm going to slide in and out but probably for the time being um usually i have more than one screen but i don't today i have two laptops and it's kind of makes things a bit difficult so in front of me i've got my script and over there that way i've actually got the slideshow I'm going to bring that in and out as and when. Okay, so when I was asked to devise a workshop, or in this case a talk, um, I eventually chose to look at an area that uh, can hinder what is what it is we do as creative practitioners. Now, it's a result of my own continual observations and some of the frustrations that I've felt over the years, um, particularly when trying to develop like a process or like creating my own materials or even opinions that are formed when discussing what it is to be sustainable within the world that we live in now an example of like an opinion uh, was uh, one that i had about eight and a half years ago and when i finished my master's degree uh, in a conversation with my external examiner the last time i saw him blessed um, i imparted the opinion that we are essentially doomed if we keep adding to an environment, objects of our creation. Or put another way, we are essentially doomed if we continue to collectively proliferate and overload our environment with these objects. I don't think that's true. <clears throat> However, in any case, what is it? What is sustainability? What is it to be sustained? What is it to be sustainable? Now, it has a lot of attached meaning, and as a word, it holds a lot of weight. It is to hold, to preserve, to maintain a status quo. Um, it is to keep something going. Now, in this strict sense, it is actually contrary to this continual state of flux, which is the adaptable, flexible way of nature of cause and effect. Sustainability, along with <clears throat> other terms such as green, eco-friendly, ethical, responsibility made, and in some cases even upcycled, they lack concrete uniform definitions with foundations that, with foundations in law that create practitioners like ourselves, makers, um, companies, brands, consumers can observe. All right. Now, it's fair to say that businesses, corporate companies, multinationals, etc., they have sustainability co protocols, um, particularly within their business environment. You know, that's their their pro they might be shark companies in an environment full of sharks, but it doesn't necessarily mean in our environment. Even though I'm sure they do have those policies too. Maybe <clears throat> the Washington D.C.-based Environmental Law Institute state that sustainability and as a term and as a practice still unquote suffers from ambiguity that must be overcome if governmental and private sector decision makers are to optimize the concept's potential now in terms of our own sustainability and our practices and presumably these are not the things that we mean for the sustainable creative practitioner it is to preserve those fine, beautifully balanced ecosystems which support us, supports everything, whilst continuing what we do. That is to express through creativity. And we have done for millennia. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start with, um, well, that was the start. So I'm gonna continue with a brief history, okay, of things. It doesn't cover everything. Of course it's not, we'd be here for years. But as a species, our impact on our ecologies is very much meshed together. 
and like most if not all living creatures we we consume and as a result we produce these states of cause and effect in some ways can be observed throughout the geological anthropological and archaeological records where it may demonstrate this cause and effect having slowly shaped and is slowly shaped by these intricate ecosystems in anthropocentric terms i.e in terms relating to us as sapiens our earliest hominin ancestors diverged from our ape ancestors around six to eight million years ago now stone tooling emerged around 3.3 million years ago anthropocentric fire from a from around 1.5 million years ago and that is fire that's created by hominins like us not by natural causes like lightning strikes now the developed use of fire and like that of language is fundamental to our development and the effect that it has on the environment within which we live now from the get-go the use of fire and the desire for like specific foods um, they may have altered the natural composition of plant and animal communities around us and so it's played a huge role and also in the development of our diets and our physical and societal forms now it's deeply ingrained within us i mean who hasn't felt that deep connection when confronted with the sweet aromas of burning wood okay well that said so from 150,000 years to 11 and a half or so thousand years ago that was when the last ice age was between that time <clears throat> we had bone ores a precursor of the sewing needle and they developed right around uh, 76,000 years ago i'd sewing needles as early as 45,000 years ago and about 60,000 years ago we saw an introduction in musical instruments and that's the neanderthal flute now at around eight to ten thousand years ago agrarian societies and communities they emerged and these are farming communities and they largely depended on obviously the environment and the creation of structures of permanence like so from a shift from nomadic hunter-gathering types um, to actually becoming settlers six and a half thousand bc that was the earliest recorded concrete structures five and a half thousand years ago saw the domestication of the horse there's a lot to go here all right 3,400 BC, the first sailing vessels. And the wheel came into being in Mesopotamia around 3,500 years BC. Jump 3,000 years, and the wheelbarrow was invented somewhere in Greece. Very expensive bit of kit, no doubt. Now, 3,200 BC, and that saw the development of cuneiform script. So, for the first time, language was being noted and recorded. Okay? 3000 BC to 1200 BC, that was the Bronze Age. 500 BC to 332 BC, that was the Iron Age. Now, the water pump screw, the water screw pump, that was developed around 350 BC for the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And paper, that appeared around 100 BC in China. And the secrets of which were lost. Well, they weren't lost, they were lost to the Abbasids and the Persians of the Battle of Talas in 751 AD. Now, this is the only time I'm going to actually mention a battle in this brief, brief uh, list of historical events. But it's important because it plays that important role in that that knowledge was then disseminated throughout the Middle East and then up into Europe. Okay. Now, 850 AD gave the invention of gunpowder, and that occurred, I mean, like about 800 years, well, like that occurred about 800 years ago after the development of the compass. Okay, so woodblock printing, that appeared in China in circa 900 AD. Johannes Gutenberg accredited with the invention of the mechanical screw press in around 1436, but by 1600, its design, through an estimated thousand machines, have produced over two million books in Europe. That's all important to understand because, again, that was able to transfer knowledge or propaganda, but basically the written word had a, has had a profound effect on everything in like we, we do today. Now, the 16th century century saw the development and further development of lenses, and it was obviously given rise to microscopes and telescopes. And paper currency used in China since 900 AD, connected with woodblock printing, no doubt, found prevalence in the 17th century Europe, eventually ushering a new era of international 
monetary regulation as well as the first steps towards a new monetary system of credit and electronic banking. Now, Savary's steam water pump came into being during the late 17th century, and it was the first practical use of the external combustion engine, and it was used to pump out water from mines, initially anyway. Now, the 18th century saw the, gro the growing expansion of innovation and consequent changes in societal form. Because in uh, 1760, that was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> the world's first water-powered cotton card in spinning mill was built by Richard Arkwright and partners at Cromford in 1771. And as a result of this, this is full, that Arkwright built the first factory housing development in the world. So people were taken off the land to work in the land, to working in factories and living in a conurbation. Following this, in 1777, Arkwright built the first steam powered mill in Worksworth. Now, fueled by coal, powered by steam, the iron industry makes strides. The first iron bridge constructed in 1781 in Shropshire. In 1794, saw the first petroleum powered internal combustion engine by Robert Street. I mean, all, the way, all those years ago. 1800 saw the first battery invented by Volta. Now in the mid 1800s, help, helping to fuel the second industrial revolution, the Bresmer process revolutionized the mass production of steel. And even today, steel is an extremely important commodity. The 19th century saw a dramatic increase through the mobility of people by railways, by bicycle, by motorcycles, by cars, and rapid transmission information was obtained by the use of the telegraph and the and telephone and the early developments of the radio. Okay, 1837 saw Babbage and Lovelace's analytical machine, mechanical computing. Yeah, 1869 DNA is discovered by Frederick Meischer. 1879, the first incandescent light bulb. The 1880s ushered in the Belle Epoque, the beautiful epoch. There's no wonder, first, like, you know, you had electric light and telephones. Okay. In 1884, saw the development of steam turbine, which in 2014, 80% of the US electricity generated was by this method in the USA. Now, at the dawn of the 20th century, New materials and manufacturing processes further propelled innovations with powered flight, synthetic plastics and dyes, and the development of antibiotics, early electronics, moving pictures by television, and the manufacturing production line. Now, people were able to travel greater distances faster with commercial flights. 1917, Rutherford splits the atom. In 1921, Maria Stokes founded the first UK um, birth control clinic. The Trinity test of 1945 heralded not only the atomic age, but atomic weapons. Obviously, got that a long way around. But, hey. The mid 20th century saw the development of the transistor, electronic computing, nuclear power, the commercial jet flight, and the third industrial revolution. 1957, Sputnik becomes the first man-made object in space. And in the 60s and 70s, witness space travel, developments in electronic componentry, electronic home entertainment systems, random access memory, and the microtrip processor. It also was when global tourism started to boom because of these, you know, being able to travel by jet airline. 1971, the first email was sent. Now, there's not much more I'm going to say about the history, like in the 80s and 90s, apart from the development of 3D printers, the increased development of computer power and small devices like mobile, mobile phones. Mobile phone was uh, developed in 1971 by Motorola, I think, or 73. However, and uh, finally, we have this fourth industrial revolution, which we are either on the cusp of or now in. Okay, and this was basically something that is a further development of that third industrial revolution. Okay, right, so this isn't an exhaustive list, and it did go on, I must say, uh, by no means, but I purposely left out a lot of stuff because otherwise we would be here all night and you would be nodding off, maybe. However, I've included it to convey a number of things.
and at a time scale that we've been innovating even as far back as um, say that 76,000 year old bone ore and probably beyond too. My research suggests that these items were not only practical but they were also items of status. What also it conveys is how innovation appears to have bred further innovation with the particular points in time proving explosive like these industrial revolutions. When this is tied in with that of say the geological record and through the analysis of like ice core data it also shows that these industrial increases have become increasingly detrimental to our environment okay so it conveys how deeply entrenched we are in history um, in the history we have and how it profoundly affects us today especially in terms of the things placed into this world by us how we relate to them and their effects upon the general environment. So how is this relevant at all to this topic? Well, I think it's important to understand, even to be sympathetic to how we have become a power-hungry, trend-led, throwaway society, um, which also feels as if we need, we have a need for evolutionary speed. Um, now, we've been a throwaway society for a long time. And the archaeological record of, um, as shown in digs of Roman sites, uh, ancient Roman sites, the, the disposal of ceramic ware, you know, just willy nilly or nilly willy, whatever, willy nilly. You know, this is something that's been going on for a long time. This is not new. So something that appears to be so ingrained in Western culture begs the question as to how can we arrest that? Okay, can it be arrested? Now, a past lecturer of mine commented that you cannot expect people to go back living within roundhouses. Now, that's a fair point. We have got very used to what we know. But what the current pandemic has actually shown us is that sometimes change is forced upon us and we are very, very adaptable. Okay, so I guess this is this first conundrum. And that is the bigger picture. How can society subscribe to sustainability ideals while craving the new and discarding the old? How can the general populace learn to appreciate and respect materials? Okay. Now, there are international conventions, protocols and agreements uh, with which governments sign up to and of which thereby informs policy, regulations and standards. Yes, there are other things that inform that too, obviously, like the lobbyists. Now, these include, uh, and they are part of the tip of the iceberg, the following like conventions. So you have the 1972 World Heritage Convention with the goal of identifying, preserving potential sites important to cultural and natural heritage. You have the 1973 Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. And that covers some, or at the time it covered some 36,000 plants and animals. Now, in 1987, the World Commission on Environmental and Development published Our Common Future. And this is one of those publications whereby the term sustainability was coined. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol on substance, Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer stems from the Vienna Con Convention of the Protection of the Ozone Layer. 1992, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and that aims to promote and conserve uh, the conservation and the sustainable use of biodiversity. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol supplements this 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on climate change to limit greenhouse gas em emissions. In 2016, the Paris Agreement, which is also part of that 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, with the aim of keeping this century's global, uh, global temperature rise below two degrees Celsius. We're not doing very well with that, by the way. Okay. Right, so that's all well and good. Okay, these are like frameworks. So an example of how such things influence design can be seen in so my own impact lab research for the 65 projects teach box 
And what are these, this is a local initiative and the teach box basically allows medical training even in remote areas of the world. And my result, my role as a researcher and a developer takes, um, is in the development of emergency surgical procedure models. Now, with the aim of their, these files that I generate, they can be made available to anyone with a 3D printer anywhere in the world. Okay, now my understanding is, is that they're free as well, which is really cool. Okay, however, these models, they not only have to meet fairly strict standards in medical training, um, but they also, um, in their, in, they, they need to meet strict standards in their environmental impact from the very creation of the 3D print filament material to maybe the disposal or reformed into further models. Now to help ascertain the hows and the whys, well, I, I mean, I don't really know, except I had to look at the various guidelines and such as those set by the, the World Health Organization and standard sets by the EU, the UK, the USA and so on and so forth. And those standards actually surprisingly really similar they all kind of come from the same place. Now, populations don't always know or maybe even care what it is, where it, come from, where it comes from and where it goes. And education and changes in social behavior go a very long way. But as creative types, maybe we should take up that mindfulness mantle and design in a say maybe a closed system fashion from start to finish to start again and so on and so forth okay i just want to add i apologize if i'm teaching you to suck eggs but that's the way of this talk now this is known as uh, regenerative design it's also known as cradle to cradle or c to c and this was proposed by two guys madonna who Dono, Mac Dono, and Brungart in 2002. Now it's unlike what is regarded as cradle to grave, whereby a resource is extracted, it's used, maybe manufactured, machine processed, and then ultimately disposed of when it's reached the end of its life. And cradle to cradle takes a biometric approach where the design of products and systems emulate nature's processes where materials are viewed as nutrients uh, circulate in a healthy, safe metabolism. Now this implies that C to C, this C2C model is, is sustainable and considerate of life for future generations, where an item's life cycle is born, used, and then reborn again. It promotes upcycling and not downcycling like disposal but it's not particularly supportive of the three R's. That is recycle, reuse and reduce. And so it has for many reasons, it's critics. I, I mean, I surmise that if an item is created within C2C framework, then there should be no need for the three R's. Now the conundrum is this, in principle, it's all very well and good for things designed and fabricated today using that cradle to cradle framework. But where do current existing items that were designed in so a cradle to grave frame, uh, fashion fit in? Cradle to grave items that may never be able to fit in, fit in with that of cradle to cradle. So what does one do? Well, we're gonna look at these three R's and of course they have their own set of problematic issues naturally now firstly recycling uh, if you didn't know recycling is the conversion of waste materials into new products changing them from their original form by physical and chemical process does the recycling process generate more waste more harmful byproducts than it alleviates well, yes and no i mean it has to be dealt with case by case but in general do we even recycle now i live in a household we recycle in that it is undertaken by someone else. For example, the collection and the processing, processing of packaging materials. And it's on trust as well as one that has been of contract as well, that these materials will be processed properly and ethically. Well, hang on a minute. <laughs> what about that uh, uniform definition with foundations in law? 
There will always be someone who will be trying to sell you snake oil and tell you it's the elixir of life. Honesty and trust is key in the kind of design processes that we use in designing for a sustainable future. But I digress. Okay, I digress even further. Do we really know where these materials end up in any case? Do our spent electrical goods wind up being processed in another country with less stringent regulations? How easy is it for materials to be dealt with illegally, such as maybe building materials that could be potentially fly tipped? Okay, but in any case, materials that are recycled are generally known as in they have display information as to what they are. Now, it is also fair to say that not everything is currently recyclable, okay? So things like films and that, they, they are potentially of issue, okay? But how does one difference, differentiate between different plastics, textiles or glass? If you deal with found objects, such as collecting materials off the beach, how do you know that they are not harmful to you or anything else through further processing or use? Should they even be used at all? Or is it better to place them in the hands of a body who can decipher what they are and how to deal with them? Okay. Now, dealing with large quantities of plastic pollutants, for example, this is becoming increasingly lucrative. And will, you know, definitely so. As there's an EU drive to see it used as manufacturing feedstock. I don't mean they're going to be feeding it to animals, but they will be fed into the manufacturing process instead of using virgin materials. Now, this also demonstrates that currently keeping these materials in circulation is by far better than letting them end up festering within the environment, okay, where they shouldn't be. Secondly, reuse. And that's defined as the use of materials more than once in their original form instead of throwing them away after each use. Reuse keeps new resources from being used for a while longer and old resources from entering the waste stream. Now, this includes, to an extent, make do and mend. It may feel almost as if we're just staving off the inevitable disposal. And I suppose, fair enough, there's only so many glass jars one can end up with. I mean, in my case, I admit to storing noxious solvents in them, such as varnishes and lacquers and oils that I'd, I'd make and conjure in order to use in woodwork and restoration. Now, of course, you don't have to use glass vessels and that, or you don't have to buy stuff that continually pr is provided in these vessels, okay? There are plenty of initiatives whereby shops will sell you directly from a vat and they will fill your bottle or your vessel up. Okay, it's a really good idea of reuse. However, reuse can be problematic and it is dependent on those material types um, as they can break down upon use. For example, with culinary items, materials can form micro cracks and these can become places that harbor bacteria. Here's an actual issue. Now, BPA plastics, and that's bisphenol aniline, they can have a tendency to leach out. Some people might dispute that, but at the end of the day, BPA is a hormone disruptor. It's artificial estrogen, okay? So these have to be considered. Now, in terms of reduction in the reduce, to use further resources in the first place, it takes to resource uh, resources to manufacture, transport, and dispose of products. So reduction minimizes the use of new resources. Now this reduction can be implemented through locally sourced materials made into further products and sold within a local community. And this is a done thing, obviously, you know, we know this is done, people do it. I presume everyone knows it's done. However, a great deal of trade occurs over great distances. How can we circumvent what powers the wheels and propellers of the, of the freight industry? Yeah. Our products may be green, but how they get to our customers may not be regarded as so. All right. Now, in terms of what motive power, I mean, yes, I'm sure there are initiatives, but these are more of a national, international thing. And obviously, people are fighting an uphill battle because you're fighting against 
people who have lots of vested interest in the current fuel <laughs> all right okay now there is much said about the appreciation of these materials you have and there are times when these materials are upcycled and that's defined as to reuse or discarded objects or materials in such a way to create a product of higher quality or value than the original now, upcycling can be seen as a crossover between reuse and recycling in that an item is reused however additional materials or processing are required now, i find upcycling to be a gray area now, let's take mid-century furniture as an example and this includes items from the 1950s the 1960s and 1970s now personally i cringe when i see furniture that is painted distressed and placed upon pin legs okay and that is seemingly for the sake of a trend now this type of furniture is plentiful and in the main was built to last scandic style pieces are often veneered in teak wood okay and it's not cheap it's very exotic and uh, precious now the problem is that despite these veneered materials being really beautiful it can be perceived as being dated off trend belonging to your parents or your grandparents so is the modification of such ideas really upcycling does the renovation of such items with the use of shellacs oils spirit of turpentine or white spirit mean that they actually become detrimental to sustainability it's a hard question now there are merits to this this kind of so-called upcycling being that these modified items are given a new lease of life instead of ending up on the tip occasionally i do walk past skips and there are really nice 1960s scandic style sideboards sitting in them well i can't take them all okay as i said i mean they are plentiful and we live in a waste society now the upcycling of these items can perpetuate the value of them and it is this idea of value which is key in terms of the aesthetic the material and of course monetary okay but upcycling can also be problematic when described as a creation of product of higher quality of value it can be ambiguous okay so another potential problem with material upcycling becomes the apparent it becomes apparent when said materials are actually bound by international laws or even by personal ethics okay so i've got some piano keys they date back from a 19th century piano they came into my possession okay there was nothing wrong with that piano apart from i mean you imagine a piano being nice, nice and black and sleek and whatnot this was covered in the most beautiful marquetry but it was lifting in parts all it probably would have taken was a hot iron to stick those back down into the rabbit skin glue. Instead, it got dismantled. I came the recipient of these beautiful keys. All right. Now, the black keys are made from the now banned African black ebony. OK, um, you can get black ebony. It's probably grown in Ecuador because some smart aleck decided to have plantations of the stuff some 60 or so years ago now they're coming to fruition but the white keys they are made from wood veneered with ivory okay and it's fair to say that these keys obviously they could have been used in the renovation of another piano and as i said that piano could have just been repaired now i've used some of the ebony parts as part of wooden of a wooden product yeah however the ivory is problematic on a different level as there is no law or there wasn't any law at the time that says i cannot refashion this ivory into another object for other uses because that ivory has already been fashioned from its original form as a tusk however if they were tusks and no matter what the age they cannot be worked now to date these beautiful exotic veneers of ivory they live in a box and they wait for their final outcome and i was going to use them for something or other however 
it was whilst I was studying the work of an Italian designer called Emmanuel Pantanella, who uses fine woods, stones, and reutilizes ivory within his own creations, that I started to question his and by proxy my own ethics. And so the conundrum is such do I reuse these materials in order to celebrate, to encourage an appreciation for their divine qualities? Or do I bury them under an elderberry bush that I'm going to get? I mean, these are very exotic, endangered materials. They're beautiful. And they're not only visually beautiful, they're beautiful to work with. Should they be promoted and further promoted as objects of desire? Or should they be memorialized, particularly the ivory, for sustaining plant growth and of that which depends on said plant? Now, it sounds like a no-brainer. OK, yeah, of course, I'm going to use them to make exotic bags. No, of course, I'm not. I'm going to stick them under a bush and I'm going to compost them. But in part, it highlights the question of material ethics and when using materials that have these kind of attachments to them. When using materials which we know not their origin or when deciding whether to preserve or to upcycle. OK, so material wise, we've looked at some issues around their further utilisation. Now, if we're concerned with creating a paper trail, reinforcing our credentials of what we create and the final outcome of the things we create, what about the sources of virgin materials, their properties and available access to innovative processes? Now, here at the Fab Lab, we use an array of materials and processes. Now, in terms of these processes, I'm going to look at, I'm using 3D printing as an example. And there are many, many flavors of 3D printing, excuse me, including FDM, fused deposition modeling, SLA, stereolithographic, SLL, selective laser sintering. Now, for us at the lab, they primarily involve some kind of plastic polymer. Okay. And in terms of their environmental credentials, not all plastics are the same. Now, we use a lot of PLA plastic, and PLA is short for polylactic acid. It is not an acid, but it is, but it is a bioplastic and may also be, um, and is also biodegradable. They are derived from plant starches, essentially. Now, we also use TPU, and this is called thermopolyurethane and they're quite flexible it can be quite hard but again it can be a bioplastic and may also be biodegradable but is biodegradability any good what if you wish to place these materials within a composter probably not and this is because how those materials are made bioplastics for example as i said are starch-based polymers However, the process of polymerization, this creation of these plastics may utilize a metal catalyst such as tin. Now, you would not want to introduce the increased amounts of this metal into your food chain via composting. It's harmful. However, there are those bioplastics that use other methods of polymerizations, and they are in line with specific ISO or ASTM standards. And the specifications and in that they are they read the specifications for compostable plastics. They don't contain these heavy metals. OK, so these emergency surgical procedure modules I'm designing, they're fabricated with materials that meet those specifications. They have to. Now, in terms of wood, it can be asked as to where it's originated from. Is it local, wind blown, or commercially felled? Was it washed up on a beach? Yeah, beautiful wood washed up on a beach. <laughs> is it F FSC? And what FSC is, that's the Forestry Stewardship Council, and that's an international non profit, multi stakeholder organization that is established in 1993. And that claims, they claim to promote responsible management of the world's forests. But the question is, does the wood originate from an environmentally sensitive area, if you're using it, like that of Namibian rosewood? Okay. 
only like last year when the, the Nibian government were really upset that their their rosewood forests were being felled they're trying to preserve them and again we have the issues of transport that come into play okay so in other terms of processing do these materials also produce harmful particulates and off gases if you are using engineered materials such as plywood are they bonded together using phenoic resin glues like bisphenol formaldehyde okay I mean, it, this, this glue has its qualities for sure. It's really strong. It's fairly waterproof, or it can be. But if so, if, if these materials do contain those kind of substances, should you be cutting or engraving them using a laser cutter? Now, occasionally, what are you doing? Now, occasionally, it's facilities that are the issue. And more to the point, the lack of especially when it comes to the development and the fabrication of materials that have specific requirements. For example, in developing uses for mycelium, marine fungi, or yeast and bacterial orientated materials, a biolab setup is really beneficial. If working to produce techno fabrics, a specific setup is also desirable. Now, this is not to say that these kinds of experimental areas cannot be explored at home or in a shed. However, technical equipment and or expertise is on hand at dedicated facilities. Now, there are many fabrication hubs and initiatives, Fab Labs being one of them. However, even within Fab Labs, there is a lot of differentiation between them. Individual Fab Labs offer different services, may have used different software, different equipment, they run different courses and their expertise is based on the equipment they hold and the knowledge base to use them. Okay, I'm actually coming to the end of this talk. It's amazing. I thought it'd, I never knew it'd go on for an hour, but it's about 45 minutes. So conclude with the subject of what is meant to be sustainable, green, eco-friendly, ethical, responsibly, responsibly made. It's a bit murky. It can be pretty grey, but it is not unfathomable in the slightest. And as I say, you might come up with these conflicts in yourself about what it is to be able to create sustainably. And sometimes that can hinder what we do. Let's do barge on through and find a way. So I hope this talk has provided at least a background into the whys and the hows creative practitioners like ourselves can explore and develop environmentally savvy credentials and that the conundrums that are often faced are in the main based upon a series of pros and cons. Now ultimately there are guidelines in which in order to help us negotiate a way through the quagmire. But finally online resources should never be overlooked. Now admittedly I, I still think in terms of the local reference library when thinking about these things but there is a wealth of free information of helpful hacks and instructions that can give guidance and inspiration when devising and creating your low impact masterpieces. Thank you very much. Thanks, Owen. Uh, thank you for Bye. that talk. Uh, I think some of the participants were expecting some slides, but uh, you had a bit of an issue just to, to share the slides. Is that right? I did. Very yeah. much, very much an issue. I mean, in terms of the his like the history talk, there were just slides of I don't know pictures of industrial sites and phones. But yes, in terms of um, in terms of like well, I was talking about recycling, upcycling. Yeah, there definitely were images there. So some of the work would include, in I mean, I can elaborate a bit further. So in terms of upcycling, um, I use the example of Lucy Turner um, as one example. And what Lucy does, she takes, she does, she takes uh, mid-century furniture, like G-plan furniture, and she applies carefully cut um, for micro and other finishes to it. And they are striking. They look great. I mean, some of them are not to my taste, but it's not about that. The fact is, there's someone going out there and extending the life and hopefully um, making people aware that this, this furniture is beautiful 
um, it's often cheaper. Um, in terms of people using virgin materials, well, you've got Tom Rashfield, who makes the, the rather wonderful steam bent ash lamps, you know, and yes, he would use FCS materials. Um, some examples like that are, are wonderful because the impact of what you're doing potentially is quite low, uh, you know. Um, unfortunately, you've still got to transport the stuff. Um, and then I was also looking at um, Lolly Jagger. Lolly Jagger, the chairs, the furniture, and these are made out of um, recycled plastics. And they're great. They're great. Because, like, you know, plastic, I find a pen here. So I things like this, you know, I've got a disposable pen, but is it disposable? They break here. You can repair it with a bit of glue. I mean, they do break. I know they break, and I do repair them. But the material they're made, yes, it's people throw them away, and God knows how many pens have been discarded over the over the decades. But that material is precious, and it's not just precious because of what you can do with it, because plastics are one of the most versatile materials around. But it's precious in what it can actually do and how detrimental it can be to the environments that we live in. Obviously not all plastics, I like that. Um, and I also looked at another recycled uh, guy, which is um, a guy called Jasmine, um, I don't know, what's his name, Wahali? And basically made a beautiful lamp and it's made out of basically crushed glass that is bonded together using plant resins. Um, which I think derived somehow from sunflower seeds. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful use. Yeah, so I, I apologise in advance for the lack of visuals. Um, as I said, I'm not necessarily the most technologically savvy person, even though I work with technology all the time. Yeah, yeah no, that's why I think we're getting some some participants asking for the uh, the slides to be shared uh, at the end of the presentation. So when we'll do the follow up, we'll make sure to do that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and also, I've got a transcript. It is is written. I do have a list of um, bibliography as well. But if you want that, you have to give me um, a, just a little bit of time to tidy it up and actually um, get it in a PCA um, style Harvard formatting. Um, I have to do. I can't just give it out as it is. It's, it'd be a bit confusing. But if if people want that as well, yeah, for sure. For sure, for sure. I mean, the only thing I didn't really talk about, but could have talked about, was the idea of the new materialism, which is a wonderful idea. That could, you know, I mean, it's the I, I suppose the idea has been around for a while, but uh, to be further developed by some guy called Potts and um, some other guy, John something, <laughs> excuse me, from um, from uh, Schumacher College. Yeah, it's uh, wonderful. It's got such implications. I mean, that's the thing with um, a lot of these like guidelines and maybe the, the, this conundrum, the, the implications are not just in designing, but they can be applied in a lot of other things. I mean, I didn't touch upon things like rewilding and uh, the fact that some people don't like rewilding. They think it's detrimental to um, land management practices that have been um, ongoing for, for centuries, if not millennia. But I, I, it's not an argument that I know about, really, apart from that. Some people turn their nose of us up with the idea of beavers and whatnot. Why? I don't know. <laughs> right. So I wonder if we have any questions from the audience for uh, Owen tonight. Oh, that's fantastic. We just got one. Uh, so um making objects from natural materials such as wood can be used uh, for carbon uh sequestration uh what resources do you have in fabric plymouth for processing wood uh we have well start with like laser cutting we have access to uh well we have a cnc router so we tend to make flat uh planar objects on that um and that's uh that can be furniture i run a flat pack furniture course well i haven't run it recently unfortunately um but hoardings signage anything like that um we can mill it we have cnc milling capabilities um that's in the fab lab itself but there are other possibilities for maybe the college and that includes things like steam bending and vacuum bagging yeah i hope that answers your question I think so. I'm going to move to another one from uh, Felicity. So uh, what do you see as the global solution for the future? That's a that big is... one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, we're doomed. Uh, no, um, yeah, that is a that's a really, that's a difficult question. Well, what I see is um, is through the likes of legislation, through the emergence of um, particular technologies that can actually deal with some issues and like so like renewable energies. Um, they're important, um, but the thing is, with some renewable energies, like you know things like solar panels, they're not efficient. Really, there's a lot of energy that goes in to create them, but, but you know, it, I suppose it's better than nothing, really, to have solar farms. So, but it's it's trying to not only solve or get around this problem of um, not so much consumption. I think consumption can be dealt with in how things are designed and what and how those materials are used and reutilized. Um, but this has to be done on a global level. But, but on a local level too mm, hard one yeah a really hard question um but uh, again i mean the thing is innovation happens a lot and it happens quickly and occasionally i'll get snippets of information like oh yeah someone's working on bacteria that eats this stuff wouldn't that be amazing or you know <laughs> young young guys who um develop initiatives on how to basically um uh, extract and sort plastics from uh, from the ocean and the oceans it's a really difficult one when you know uh, when it comes to things like control of ourselves and and our own and managing our own expectations uh, um and it might even be changes in education like 10 years ago i went to a, an open day at a, a rather famous prestigious art college in london um and I was looking at innovation design engineering. Now, the thing is, when I sat in the auditorium to be told that um, the creator of the iPhone such a, was um, an alumni, I say creator of the iPhone, the actual design package was uh, a member of the alumni from that department. But then to promote the idea that it was great that they created so many iPhones that it could fill Kensington Gardens, maybe, I can't remember if it was a meter and a half or three meters thick. That's a serious amount of volume. When, you, when you're faced with ideas like that, you also need to be faced with the idea that maybe you don't own, we don't own the materials that we have in our possessions. Oh, my phone's not here. It's like, still, but say these laptops in front of me or in front of you, you might own those. You probably do own them. But do you need to own them? Do you need to own those materials, those precious materials inside? And, um, you know, I, I remember when you used to take, like, glass lemonade bottles to a shop or a fish and chip shop and you've got a deposit back at 10 pence maybe these are all part and parcels of these solutions in, in moving forward oh yeah, yeah big question <laughs> we've got a couple more so um we've got one from uh Masia, uh who asks what uh, where is uh cost effective effectiveness sorry in all of this uh producing mm. products that are also uh sustainable and affordable yeah well cost effectiveness is an important one very important because at the end of the day um I think ultimately, um, like things like this, I'm going to use this pen as an example. The the mechanisms that um, have resulted in the production of this have uh, they've been generated one thing after another over a, a period of time. Um, yeah, cost effective, like you know, like mass production. <sighs> the thing is, if you want to get into mass production. Um, people who are in mass production are put generally in a in a better position in order to create and innovate new materials. Okay, so if you want cost effective way of recycling bottles, plastic bottles into coats, I think you're going to be very hard pressed to do it at a local level. The cost effectiveness in that sense will probably come on a big scale. Um, obviously, you know, if you're in the if you're in the if you're in business you're there to obviously sustain yourself and that may, may be in terms of making money but again you know maybe you've got to manage your own expectations so yeah okay you can have um i mean jesus you could buy um electronic goods so cheaply and yeah it's cost effective to have it made abroad but actually there is more than just an environmental impact of that um, there's an impact on social welfare now, I didn't cover social welfare. I tried to skirt around 
these kind of issues of um, social welfare, of equality and stuff like that. So yeah, cost effectiveness. Hmm. I don't really know the answer <laughs> to that. I'm, I'm sorry. I think we've probably got to uh, learn to sort of uh, pay a little bit more for what we use as well. Yeah, definitely. For the switch. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, another question from Chloe uh, about plywood. Um, so, is there a sustainable plywood without toxic glue? Yes. In short. Yes, it does exist. It does exist. So these kind of plywoods, uh, they use non-phenolic resins to bond them together. Um, they're, they're quite specific for use in things like laser cutting. So they don't off-gas uh, fumes or formaldehyde in them, for example. Um, I always tell my students or anyone, I like, cut something on the laser cut. The, the, that, when I was saying earlier on about that deep ingrained thing about the smell of burning wood, people always go, and it's like, you don't know what you're doing. You do not know what you're sniffing and what you're taking into your lungs. So, but in short, yes, yes, there is definitely. And we, when we use that stuff, definitely use it. Stuff is really good. It's good stuff, really high quality as well. I like it. Not cheap. Uh, thanks, Dan. So, um, moving on to uh, another question from Chris: How intrinsic are uh, ecological principles to design and crafts uh, in terms of curriculum at PCA? You would say? Ooh. Not, I'm not percent sure about that because um, I live in my own silo, which is in the fab lab. I mean, it's, that's not that's not true. I deal with a lot of people. Um, I would say it's it's very apparent. It is something that is definitely discussed. Um, the, the, the thing is with education generally, it's that education is a, a, a wasteful thing. Um, you might have, I mean, I used to work at a university and like every year a large skip would appear and it would get full, filled up with stuff. Um, and I worked in a school for nine years. Um, every year, lots of stuff got thrown away. What's problematic, um, with, particularly in certain areas of craft, is like what you what do you do with um, like ceramic materials that have been fired and spent? I mean, I suppose you could grind them up, but the, the, what 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 is it that you do with them? How, how how is it that people? How do you impart that mindfulness in the materials you use? It's a really really difficult question um, in in that sense. But yeah, it is something that is obviously promoted and those ideas are given because, you know, materials are precious. If you're a creative type, particularly when you're out of that really comfortable world of education, I mean, it's really cold outside, yeah? And things cost. So it's, these are the kind of things that, you know, naturally are taught. As, because as, as, as to the, the impact in the curriculum, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'll just jump in on that one. I know that some of um, the colleagues are working really hard to uh, make sure that we uh, work and focus on sustainability. So part of the new courses are going to um, be sort of uh, around the signature, signature materiality of Plymouth. Uh, yes. This type of uh, material that we've got available uh, in Plymouth and in Devon, and and how we can uh, use that uh, more to create and make. So, um, so yeah, that's one of the uh, sort of newest focus uh, in terms mm. of curriculum. Um, moving on to another question from uh, Emma: What processes can be used with recycled plastic within uh, the Fab Lab? You can machine them. You can CNC machine it, and obviously depending on the plastics, um, if they're things like polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, we can cut them on the laser cutter. And when I say we can machine them, and that, that's called CNC machining, these are very high speed cutting tool, spins very quickly, and that moves relative to the workpiece. And with that, you can do sculptural things like make a character. I mean, they make this, this is felt, but you know, you, you can make objects like that. Um, and the solid material. Now that subtractive process, it produces waste. Um, in terms of other recycled uh, materials, now we're yet to obtain um, a filament extruder. But once we do, um, or if you have the, pro the, the ability to extrude things like polypropylene, polyethylene, even nylons, um, and, a, and, and a such into filament, 
they can be 3D printed. We can 3D print them. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. Um, another question from Grant. It's fun that you guys are coming up with so many questions. That's really uh, great. So uh, is there anyone working uh, in FabLab Plymouth uh, creating crossovers with yarn-based crafts such as knitting, uh, crochet or waving? No, not in the Fab Lab. Um, just, I mean, just so you know, the, the like, so my colleague's background, there's a master glassman, there's an animator, furniture maker, a ceramicist. I'm a bit of a renaissance man, I suppose, but basically I come from a bicycle engineering background. You know, I make bicycle frames uh, for a living for a while. Um, however, there are people within the college that are actually interested in this kind of stuff. So in the college itself, we have the Fab Lab, but over the last couple of years, we've had the, the what have been sent out these other labs, like the material lab. So that'll be like woods and metals, jewelries and whatnot. Um, but then you have the fabric lab, and they are things like textiles. So these are kind of things that some of the tutors, some of the lecturers, they yeah, they are particularly interested in, in those, and um, particularly the things like knitting. Now it was a bit uh, fairly recently that um, I well I was initially um, as part of the lab was looking into maybe ways of um, becoming like a fabric lab like that they have in uh, Amsterdam. Okay, in the Amsterdam Fab Lab, they have a, a good bio lab and a fabric lab, are really good. But um, it's probably unlikely that we're gonna go down that route. Um, but yeah, these, these, uh, these, um, these materials are like, I'm, very, I'm really interested in the idea of, how you can manipulate the woven materials, particularly with like bioresins. Yeah, I mean, you know, these kind of processes are fairly old, um, but mm, yeah. But what I find is in my own frustration, where, where you know, just wherever I work, wherever I worked, um, is that sometimes um, the things you want to do do exceed the facilities that are around you. You have to look, maybe look somewhere else for that, or talk to the fabric lab. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. So, um, do you have any more questions? I'm just looking if I haven't missed any. I saw something involving a question about acetate. So I just saw it in the corner of my eye. Now, let me open that window. Uh, I heard that the mystery acetate comes from trees. Hmm, possibly. It's like how acetate is made. I mean, cellulose definitely does, but acetate is actually um, problematic. Uh, for us in terms of we can't really do much with it in, in, in terms of processing. Um, we can machine it. We can't laser cut it. Well, you can, you can, we can do stuff that is incredibly thin, like that you'd have on an over an old overhead projector, for example, but anything thicker than that, it, it doesn't, it doesn't like that kind of processing. Um, someone to really talk to about acetate, if you want to know is like Kate Crawford from Precious Plastics. Sorry, Kate, if I just, Stopped you in there, <laughs> you know. I, I, I don't. I think I, I can't presume that you know. Yeah, I think she's she's uh, she's with us tonight. Oh yes, yeah, so I can see. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, possibly. A lot of things are from trees. Actually, you'll be surprised at some of the materials that um, can derive from trees. But even then, um, sometimes you've got to be careful. No, as I say, I use uh, spirit of turpentine. Well, turpentine is harmful stuff, and uh, it's called a high pressure fluid. And the reason why it's called a high pressure fluid because it evaporates really quickly in atmospheric conditions. The problem is turpentine, when that mixes with like nitrogen gas, it does create a lot of ozone, um, and it's naturally produced. Trees naturally off gas this stuff, but yeah, not not everything produced by trees is necessarily good. It's how, it's how you use it, particularly. Okay, so we've got John who specified that, um, yeah, the acid is uh, plant material uh, treated with acetic acids, uh, so vinegar. And another question from Chris, um, you mentioned bioplastic and the issues mm. of them. 
uh, actually uh, been biodegradable? Wouldn't it be better to use recycled plastic, which can be recycled over and over? And do you have the facilities to recycle plastic as well as producing uh, plastic products? It's a great question. I love that question because it relates directly to what I was talking about. Well, hmm. it's, it's a good question. The thing is, it's what, what purpose is it going to serve? Um, so, for example, and the, the only example I'm going to use here is my research, my these emergency procedure models, um, in order to use particular plastics in them, they've got to be flexible. They can't be rigid because they have to emulate like flesh and bone and cartilage. Um, now, yeah, you can recycle things like thermal polyurethane. And yeah, is it is would it be good? I think in most circumstances, yes, I agree. However, the, the one of the reasons why we go down the route of um, of uh, say bioplastics or certainly compostable plastics is that um, these these models will end up in well, potentially in countries that have really really strict regulations on such things. So if you went to um, I think it's Rwanda, I get mixed up with Burundi. I think it's Rwanda. Um, they are super strict when it comes to plastics. In fact, you can't even take plastic bags into that country. Okay, according to my um, my uh, my industrial research colleague uh, in the six two five project. Um, so in this in that case, it um, it can prove actually beneficial. I suppose that the the thing is, um, if we live in such a throwaway society, then really you don't want people throwing away these these uh, hard wearing long living materials um, i mean maybe you're better off having them so they can be uh decomposted and de disposed of in other ways um i think it's well horses cook for courses uh, is an answer to that one but yeah i mean i like pla i mean i like plastics there's no two ways about it i, mean, I don't trust them but i like them <laughs> yeah, it's a good project to uh, to look into uh, that also started locally is uh, Precious Plastic, mm. uh, which is a global initiative uh, that's basically considering that, you know, for uh, centuries, what well, for decades, we've been using uh, plastics in a very uh, short, for a very short duration, uh, whereas plastic can last for so long. So it's about uh, just recycling them. They've got a, a basically a shredder. Uh, which they can turn uh, the plastic into little pieces and then uh, melt it back again into uh, long-term objects. And we've got that initiative started uh, in Plymouth over the summer uh, last year. So um, yeah, we've got a Precious Plastic Plymouth uh, group now. So um, I think they've got a space in Royal William Yard. Uh, that's to be confirmed. Uh, it's all new and, and, and starting. So I recommend uh, you check it out. We'll share some links as well. And also answer the second part of that question because I realised you asked. Um, you also asked about um, how we recycle plastics. Currently, not. We have to rely on a somebody who provides a service to take the material away, and it's it's a shame. But it's something that in the lab we really want uh, the ability to basically uh, shred the, the the plastics because actually, you know, when when you're three D printing, it goes wrong. And it really does go wrong, and like you know, it could take hours. You could have a, you could have three D printed something with a kilo of of material for it to go wrong. Um, we don't like seeing that kind of material wasted. We certainly don't want to see that going into that kind of um, more generic recycled um, environment. We want to do that ourselves. So, not at the moment, but at some point, we definitely do want to do that. Yes. Maybe we can take them to process plastics to get them shredded um, and maybe extruded. I don't know. I know there's a, an annual prize every year um, as an international thing for someone to come up with some kind of innovation that, um, and it's based upon, I think I can't remember the name of it, but it was based upon the idea that someone um, developed a really cheap way of extruding plastic into usable filament um, by using a drill, an auger, and a, and a hot heat source um, for less than like two hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, I love projects like that, but um, yeah, we are not yet, not yet. And how, as and when, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're we're um, sort of working with Kate and and 
sort of give them uh, our plastic waste for them to turn it back into uh, something else. Um, but um, yeah, just looking at the chat, we've got another question from uh, Madeleine. So is it true that plastics can be recycled a um, limited number of times? I think that depends on the type of plastic, but I'll leave it to Owen to answer. Yeah, it depends on the type of plastic, really. I mean, um, certain things like PLA, I mean, it does degrade. Um, and it chemically, it chemically degrades. It is a, it is a bioplastic. But um, things like this guy, yeah, maybe not so. Um, I mean, sometimes you do, you, you know, in, in the processing of plastics using recyclable materials, um, sometimes there will probably be additives added into that. But saying that, as I said about like, the EU um, wanting to, well, not only by 2030, uh, ban single-use plastics for packaging, but also use it, use recycled plastic as the majority of the feedstock in industrial processes for making products. You, you know, we don't need to make any more of the stuff. Well, generally, I think we don't need to make any more of the stuff, but it is because you know, people have vested interest in making these new uh, new plastics, employs people, blah, 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 blah. You know, excuse me for being flippant about that. Um, would you want to recycle post-consumer recycled plastics as food packaging? Oh, that's for Madeline, that's not for me, I guess. Yeah, I was not sure. <laughs> hmm. I see you mean like, like, you know, would you want to use um, stuff as food? Pack? Um, well, you know, I suppose that's managing expectations at the end of the day um, in, in these processes, as long as they're clean. Food packaging generally is clean or it has to be clean and uh, where, how you clean it, like in an autoclave or whatever. Yeah. I don't see the problem with doing that. I mean, there might be a problem with recycling food. I mean, like it's some kind of crazy soylent green thing idea just occurred to me. But uh, plastics, I wouldn't have a. I personally would not have a problem with the recycling of post-consumer plastics into things that hold food at all. You know, it's clean as long as it's clean and sterile or whatever it needs to be. Yeah, and Kate's just added that um, there are lots of regulations around food packaging. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. As I said, uh, the uh, there's a the, there is uh, European regulations coming in, but it is by 2030 that they want to see single-use plastics done away with, in food, particularly food packaging. Um, now, okay, we we've effectively left Europe because of like Brexit, but um, as I said, regulations they they extend from one regulatory body to another and it's and as i said about um like eu uk american german standards whatever around the world that they are all very similar because they're all feeding from the same kind of pot of information and standards and of course you know it's that kind of prestige thing you know governments don't want to be left behind or seen as lagging or whatnot so it's good but these kind of things, they all they, they, they tend to stem from conventions anyway, um, you know, and, and from conventions, protocols are drawn up, um, treaties may be made, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've got... Um... Another question from Chris. Um, mm. Do you have principles for what people can make in the Fab Lab uh, ethos and not making single use product with the 3D printer, for example? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, we don't like it. We don't like uh, maybe single use stuff. Um, we don't. We don't like. I mean, it sounds terrible, but we don't like rubbish being made. <laughs> Um, I, I'm really particularly f funny about some of the stuff we are asked to create. Now, problematically is that um, we are in a, um, an educational institution and uh, most of our work is curriculum based. 
Um, and so there are times when we are asked to create these things that will ultimately end up in the bin. Generally, though, most stuff we make is not single use at all. It's multiple use or it's, uh, well, when I say single use, not short term single use, at least. Uh, um, but it depends because um, other things we do, we do quite a lot of rapid prototyping. And we use particular print medium for that. Like maybe a selective laser, or maybe a selective laser um, sintering, but uh, certainly stereolithographic printing using um, plastic resins. Um, like it's great for making prototypes, but ultimately that's all they're ever going to be. They're all they're going to ever be used for. So it's a tricky one. But generally, we don't want to use single-use stuff. I mean, the thing is, uh, all the research projects that we do in the lab as part of the impact lab, they are all, in some way or another, concerned or involved the idea of uh, sustainable practices. Um, hello, Zola. Zola, my dog's just coming. Uh, <laughs> um, whether that is, say, the reclamation of anaesthetic gases, which are very harmful, or even the uh, reclamation of carbon dioxide from broom processes that can then go on to um, like help horticulture and stuff like that. You know, plants need carbon dioxide, they produce oxygen, beautiful. Locks that carbon dioxide, that carbon in somewhere else. Um, so maybe, you know, we, we make up, if, for the things that we can't do, well, I think we make up in other ways. Yeah. I wish we could just recycle our thinking, print the plastics. That that'd be great. 